Hi, Matthias. You you will have to check uh, through the uh, th uh, through the acceptance okay. buttons on when attendees try to join. So you should. Okay, I think we are we are live, we are live now. now. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Hey, so um, we have here uh, four four of us uh, on the on the round table: uh, Matthias, Simon, Tommy, and myself. Uh, and and uh, today we'll be talking about deep tech to be software. But uh, before we get started, let's actually uh, have a round of uh, introductions from everybody, so so we know uh, who are around the table. So. Uh, We'll start from, from Matthias. Okay, hi, my name is Matthias Kaiser. I'm a co founder and CEO of Exponential Technologies. Um, we have built an um, industrial AI platform that helps um, engineers, scientists, uh, researchers, and the development of um, machine parameters, uh, chemical formulations, and in the management and mitigation of uh, production anomalies. And um, our our motto is uh, a convenience, convenience, convenience. So it should be very easy to use um, uh, for for everybody in the industry. And I think this is also an important part of B two B software. I think which we will also discuss. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and uh, also Emil joined. Uh, Emil, perhaps you will go with your intro next. Yes. Hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry for the short technical but nevertheless happy to see you here. My name is Emil Sundikov. I'm a Chief Technical Officer at Longenesis. So uh, we are working within the digital health space and uh, working towards providing digital tools for accelerating biomedical research pipeline. So basically we, we see ourselves within you know three major pillars, which is how we can provide uh, real-time borderless uh, data discovery for uh, machine learning or data identification for further analytics. Uh, seamless and borderless onboarding of study participants and engagement for real-world data uh, generation for, you know, for, 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 for the sake of the uh, faster and uh, more data-driven studies. Yeah, happy, happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Simon. Hi, everyone. My name is Simon Litvinov. I'm CEO and co-founder of Precision Navigation Systems, and this is what we do. So we, we do precision navigation. So actually, we've we have built GPS correction signal provider that helps with the centimeter level uh, accuracy of positioning and navigation for drones, robots, IoT applications, and all these other autonomous things that needs to be positioned precisely. So otherwise, otherwise you don't know where these things are, or where these mm -hmm. things are going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tommy. Yeah, hi, hi guys. I, I I know at least Simon and Christian quite well. I mean, I'm a partner at Karma Ventures, like Christian. So, uh, and uh, and we we invest in uh, deep tech software companies. Uh, initial tickets from half a million to five million euros. And uh, we, we typically look for companies that have like a strong technical differentiator, but uh, also that have uh, customer proof points of value of the solution that uh, that, that they are building. My, my, my own background is, uh, is with uh, uh, mobile and semiconductors and, and, and software. And I've also been an entrepreneur uh, in, in, in a roaming, uh, roaming reselling business that grew to more than a billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, I'll give a brief of myself as well. I'm Christian. I'm also a partner at Karma Ventures. So working on Karma Ventures together with Tommy since 2014 when we started raising the first fund. Um, and uh, we have now uh, been live with the first fund since 2016, made uh, 16 investments across Europe in, in uh, deep tech companies. And most of them actually are, are in B2B space. Uh, and prior to prior to Karma, I was uh, managing the technology investment portfolio at uh, Skype's founding engineers, family office called Ambient Sound Listeners. Um, I think that um, maybe maybe one thing uh, I wanted to start off with uh, is is uh, uh, how what, what what does actually deep tech means? Because there is a, a lot of uh, let's say usage of the word, especially recently. Many investors have launched uh, deep tech funds, um, but then again, it's, it's kind of one of those buzzwords that that means very different things for 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 different people. Um, and and uh, for example, if I if I uh, uh, describe what what we mean under under deep tech at Karma, then um, 
you know, we, have, we found this really good, let's say, um, uh, really good theory from Boston Consulting Group that actually divided deep tech into, into multiple different stages, uh, where on the, let's say, uh, earliest stage, uh, it, it's a kind of a pioneer, pioneering uh, technology, um, uh, which is um, actually visionary technology, which is which is something that is still in the laboratory and and it's not actually commercial uh, commercial yet, um, uh, and and very few teams uh, can can uh, do something meaningful in this space, and 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 the commercialization is still some years away. Then the next stage is 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 when the technology gets out of this visionary tech stage and gets into the pioneering st uh, tech stage and and this is um the focus for us at karma ventures it's uh it's technology that has um been in early stages of commercialization already um it's actually uh, mastered by uh, a select amount of teams uh and and there are first early customers that are actually uh using the technology and and can can validate it and then, then the next stages are, are kind of a, already um, the stages where the technology is um, so kind of commodity. Uh, many teams across the world can do it, uh, and and the, uh, it's it's becoming more and more competitive. And and uh, all all technologies are kind of uh, flowing through this this funnel in a way that um, that they they start as visionary technology, then then going through pioneer pioneering tech phase and then commodity tech phase. And as as investors, different funds have different uh, say preferences. Some funds don't want to do pioneering or visionary tech at all. They want to do everything that's that's very much proven uh, and and uh, invest only in commodity tech. We we tend to focus on bio, pioneering tech. We want to see that it's commercially viable, but uh, it's it's, uh, it's still special enough that that uh, uh, there uh, the, the uh, few companies can do it, and there's a good potential for it because of that. And we don't want to do, for example, visionary tech because it's too early. The commercials are still unproven, and and um, it can't be uh, it can't be probably uh, meaningfully commercialized in, in in the near future or kind of during the fund lifetime. Um, so um, this is this is our view as investors but but an interesting thing to discuss would be that uh especially uh especially simon uh matthias and and emil you as entrepreneurs when you talk to uh investors and and your companies are in, in deep tech space so what are, what are the uh, you know how are you typically positioned at the investors and and what are the key challenges that uh, uh that investors actually uh throw at you when 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 you want to raise funding from from funds how do investors you know view the tech hmm. who wants to go first uh, i might jump in so mm -hmm. um, just to start the conversation from entrepreneurial side so it was usually a story when uh, so we didn't define ourselves as a deep tech but when we talked about what we're doing, so everyone is throwing, okay, you should be deep tech. <laughs> They're like, okay, we're deep tech here. Then we, for example, we apply for something else, for some, I mean, for some competition or for um, <laughs> startup challenge. Like, okay, sh people are saying, oh, you guys, you're a space tech. So, which is partly true. So we are not launching <laughs> rockets in the sky or not satellites, but we actually take the data from them. So a space tech here as well. One, uh, one time, I guess it was tech tour. So we were placed as a clean tech a startup. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it feels for me that it's not up to me to decide, you know, which, uh, which tech we're in. But I really, I had a, when you were talking, um christian about the your understanding about the deep tech and how, how it should be defined so it popped up in my mind one of the conversations with the, another investor um, the guy who is developing a space industry in new york and he asked he was asking me how much time do you need uh, for you, your solution to be applied to the market like that directly and we said okay so we are do, doing this since maybe like seven years 
and uh, so first we did it at home right now we're doing it uh, in europe where where we started a new company and uh, we can uh, provide services and he was like okay so you can provide services now so you are not deep tech so despite the fact that we were developing this like for uh, more than five years so uh, there are, uh, there are different stories uh, about that so uh, Mm. How it can be defined and uh, who de depends who you're talking to and what's the uh, what's the understanding uh, of the of the other part of what deep tech is and how should how they should define you. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but you yourself um, are in a space that uh, you know it's 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 already it's, applicable, right? Space it's, it's tech, like... space tech downstream segment, and it's <laughs> applicable. So yes. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Sumi. Yeah, I just wanted to offer a comment on on Simon's uh, classification question, and it's it's like uh, it's it's partly related to the fact that you know investors like us we make promises to our investors that uh, and, and 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 this promise is like uh, the definition of what we do, and uh, and you know if somebody has said that they are doing space tech, uh, then they need to find space tech deals. So sometimes it's 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 important from entrepreneur <laughs> point of view to know that what are you because you can then be the deal that they are looking for because you know some, some might think that space tech is only rockets but if it's this what you said like downstream data or space then if it qualifies maybe they you know so, some investors may have like uh, like money to spend but uh, but not enough targets and in that sense it's good to know what you are I say that deep tech. It's, it's, I apologize, but this is probably not like going to help in a sense that everybody's okay to do that. But uh, but it's it's then like a question of like uh, how how do the investors work with you and and support you and uh, and that's perhaps more the more the dialogue that you should be having in this deep tech this case. But, Matthias, yeah. Matthias. Yeah, I, I have there something maybe to add also to what what Simon said like. Out of our experience, it's like this for us. I mean, we also don't call ourselves deep tech. Um, we have never used it ourselves. But sometimes the label is uh, pushed upon us. Um, what, what I see that maybe um, in an, uh, for for relationship with investors and customers uh, is I think that our message is quite different when we talk with investors and when we talk with customers. And that might be a good definition of that because when we talk with customers, we're usually quite technical. Um, we have a very technical product and we can uh, talk with them the, the, the technical effects and they will understand it and uh, um, they understand what we're doing. On the other side with investors, um, it, it's, it's usually a little bit different. We have to talk more about the broader picture and everything. And I think there is often a quite big gap in, in, in between the, the, the things that we say to the two groups. And I would personally define that as deep tech because it's, uh, you know, like I understand that an investor cannot know every uh, small detail about uh, like very technical applications. Um, and and this 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 is for me at least the definition what I saw in our engagement on the one hand side with investors and on the other hand side with our customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Amy, cannot agree more to both Simon and Matthias. I think it's you know it's like a dialogue <laughs> so where you try to uh, navigate and try to adapt to both of the interest and also the scope of uh, of, um, of what they're searching for. I think a very small comment here is uh, what we've encountered in some of the communications, not only, you know, but in also in prior ventures, is that some of the funds and acceleration programs are not including uh, ICT in, into the deep tech. And that's quite interesting because, you know, mm. I, IT is, you know, is a, is a tool to be applied everywhere, whether it's space tech or chemistry or anything else, computational chemistry or anything else. But that's quite interesting because, you know, I, and for, my, for myself, I haven't, understood how to draw this, you know, nice red line where, you know, where I am myself as a computer scientist am and where is this deep side? Because I spent like, you know, seven years in academia before I worked in the lab. Okay. I hadn't, haven't had any, you know, white uh, uniform. <laughs> I was, you know, using my Crocs and shorts when I was coding <laughs> and uh, soldiering stuff. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, 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 you know, maybe some of the, some of the speakers in the, in the route table can explain it to me. That's, I think, quite an interesting thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I guess that, that we are all get 
getting to a place that probably there isn't this red line or boundary that that's on this side it is and on that side it isn't it's it's kind of, kind of a flow and and um, uh, all all let's say market participants are defining it slightly 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 differently yeah. um, we have one additional participant uh, joined uh, leon uh, maybe, maybe you can give a give a short intro uh, from from your side as well, and then then we can go to the next topics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what we do is we're currently trying to use uh, AI to apply for human computer interaction, and uh, on the B two B side, we're trying to implement our solution on kiosks in airports, supermarkets, uh, fast food chain, and also on ATM to achieve touchless interaction. Hmm. So. Um, that is what we're trying to do on the B2B side, but we want to use that route to get to the B2B side, which is to replace the computer mouse, touch screen, TV remote control, stuff like that, with just your hand and fingers. So that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, I think the, the, the most difficult thing at our current stage is actually, how can we actually get in touch with those big customers at the B2B, uh, B2B side? Because they never heard of us before. and um, I think the channel we can use is quite limited. We try to email, we try to link in, we try to call them. I think the layer of trust is very hard to be established when you consider about those big uh, organizations. They have uh, a lot of concerns. They, it, most importantly, they, they have different structures. Like most of the case, mm. I have to reach all the way to a product owner. And uh, in order to get there, I have to maybe get in touch with uh, two to three people. And in order to get there, I have to contact maybe 10 or 20 people. I think that's the biggest problem. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, all right. Uh, can I, can I think, have a comment? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was just like, you know, I'm always trying to solve problems and uh, <laughs> and, and Leon had a problem here. So, 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 um, at, at Karma and before, we've had a few interactions with companies that do new like human machine interface technologies. And uh, one, one model that I have seen work is that you kind of like need to productize your solution to uh, a demonstrator level, like with your own investment. And uh, then if you can sell like uh, a software development kit or a hardware development kit, I guess that your thing might need some new sensors as well and, and, and some software that runs. But if you could productize it to a level that you could sell the development kit for some thousands of euros, then uh, actually like I've seen like a handful of companies who succeeded with a model like that, that they are able to then set to sell these kits to uh, a number of the potential bigger companies who can be their customers and uh, then when they use them and try them <laughs> and if they become convinced then something real can happen but you kind of need to have a wide availability of your new idea for people to try it out and prove and then choose to believe and then it goes commercial but but that's just this idea that maybe productizing to a kind of a self-usable development kit level and making it available for purchase on your website might be an idea. So, yeah, that's true. And yeah. that's very true. I think it's the hardest part is how can we actually demonstrate that? Like the common mm. method we're using is using YouTube. We showcase it's, it's already working because Kio says it's actually really simple. And I mean, at back end, they're running their ap application on browsers and uh, they are using Windows systems. So it's very similar with your computer or laptop. So we actually use the same demonstration to demonstrate that for them. But uh, I, I think it's because uh, uh, we just got into touching or trying to touch very recently. So maybe there, there might be a time. The expectation for me is they might get back to me within a week. Okay. But maybe, maybe that's wrong. That's totally wrong. Maybe it has to be one <laughs> month and two yeah. months. So yeah, maybe that's on my but side. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes, maybe yes. maybe if, if we're going already all, uh, off track with the with the discussion, I will add here something. Uh, as we are, I think all uh, at least uh, somewhat in in AI and machine learning uh, space here. Um, 
our experience is first of all as uh, IT companies anyway it's very hard to show anything right if you have like some kind of hardware it's super easy you have the hardware you can you can show this is happening this is the outcome so it's very easy as a software company it's of course always a little bit more difficult but additionally what we found is that often in industrial markets and B2B markets, the market is already a little bit uh, poisoned um, through other uh, AI uh, applications. And when you approach a customer, it is like, oh yeah, there comes another one with this AI application. Um, so you want now uh, a pilot project uh, for 100,000 euros and then nothing comes out and we're basically stuck with your solution, with, with any solution and we have nothing in the end. This is often how, how, how like the, the reaction we get from the customer. And there is, of course, it's a lot of like, I mean, you have to prove value. And I, I think like it doesn't matter, like for us, I don't even call it machine learning AI necessarily. I mean, that's a buzzword, but it doesn't really matter what the technology is. In the end, it just matters the effect for the customer. And I think there we have to to get at some point. And, and mm -hmm. this is this is the, the fight we're fighting currently. Thanks, Emil. Well, just to, <clears throat> since I, I, I was uh, previously working in a hardware company, so there is also a stereotype that it is much easier to show a software solution, not you know, not the hardware solution. So, you know, guys on the other on the other side of the river are also looking, you know, quite greedy on the other side. But nevertheless, but nevertheless, it's quite interesting. You know, if we're touching the deep tech, I think a lot of stakeholders, like we we human beings, like you know some some buzzwords and we like like running there. So the same happens with AI, and you know the oversaturation with the term AI is crazy. There are like tons of people at every conference were speaking about AI, ethics and AI and this kind of stuff. They don't understand how neural networks work. So how we can, you know, speak about this stuff, but nevertheless. And, uh, you know, we have also seen, you know, with the terms like, you know, the distributed ledger of blockchain, we have seen like actually companies coming to us. So we use the distributed ledger for one of our SaaS products there. Uh, and, uh, you know, clients are coming and saying, hey, yeah, no, we don't care about the interface. No, 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 no. Blockchain, yes, blockchain. We have heard about this. You know, where we would like to have it here <laughs> on board. And uh, you know, I, I think I think deep tech as a as a buzzword is also uh, there in the space. <laughs> Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, to some of the companies. Mm -hmm. But has it changed over time in a way that that when you guys started working on your projects, uh, was it was it then different that? Uh, then it was kind of a new and obscure thing that nobody understood and nobody talked about it. And you were kind of thought, of, kind of had thought about like a bit crazy uh, doing this. And and how how has it changed over time? I think we were speaking about just a very quick comment here or answer. Uh, I think we're speaking about deep tech. You, you, you uh, Kristen, also gave uh, the quick uh, definition. So this is something that you know should be still proven for sure there is a you know value of death there so mm. here i would also okay once again say about the software solution <laughs> it, you know it's it's quite easy you know i don't know the, the use case of yo app yeah you can develop a yo app launch it to the app store and then gather the metrics from the app store or google play and then showcase it so if you have you know the retention of the customers the M mrr from i don't know buying some yo stickers there or whatever it's quite easy to show but here for sure if we're speaking about you know uh, attracting stakeholders, especially in like in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a clinical facilities, people are you know it's a, it's a black mirror episodes for them, like you know AI, data analytics, some crazy stuff. They know that's happening somewhere on Mars, Israel, and US maybe or Asia, <laughs> but not here. Like <laughs> they say, hey, you know we don't have problems, you know because privacy is there. You know we have our primary care, we have patients. We should do the, our stuff. So for sure, it's quite you know a, a long, long, long dialogue, and it's a chicken and egg problem always. So you come to to the industry, to the pharma, they say, hey, why why do you why don't you pilot this with a smaller pharma first? You go to the smaller pharma, they say, hey, where are the big guys? <laughs> and the same happens with all of the stakeholders. So I think yeah, you know, but it's it's as Matthias uh, told, it's you know, it's also not only coding or lab experimental side, it's also you know education integration showcasing piloting proving proving yeah. proving and you need to have mm. strong nerves to do that yeah mm. yeah okay i guess that this means that this um, commercialization of of uh, these technologies takes a lot longer time and we as investors we've seen that that uh, in early stages uh, 
these types of businesses actually require more capital to get to a stage where you have something, some commercial proof in place when you can go for a really big round. So they're kind of a seed uh, and seed extension and seed second extension rounds are, you know, very common in this space uh, because it takes longer time to, to, to prove the case, right? I think it's it's not just it's not just proving the case maybe to 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 add something to there, but um, often deep tech things um, come as a, like technical solution to a problem, right? But a technical solution to a problem is not a product. Um, this is often what what people what people miss, uh, especially scientists have often uh, uh, come with the expectation that they have this super new thing, the super algorithm, that super uh, technology, and that will solve all problems. The truth is, uh, it doesn't, as long as it's not uh, a full solution. And this is, I think, the 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 the, the main challenge there. It's integrating like some kind of like um, deep tech solution or, or, or scientific uh, or technical solution into a broader picture that actually brings value to the customer because the customer doesn't care at all like what kind of technology you're using they don't they could not care less about that what they care about is their return of investment and what value it brings to them and that's the only thing they care about and I think they're this is also one thing of deep tech that it's not just a technical solution it's both technical solution plus uh um yeah some some application and and uh, um, some customer connection yeah Amy. yeah i think you know quite a very quick comment since we were speaking also about you know the challenges and the, and the pipeline it was if you're looking macroscopically into the deep tech it often involves academia so it often often it will involves academic partners such as university labs institutes whatsoever and uh, in you know what we're lo looking here in, in Baltic, Latvia especially is the lack of the mindset for understanding that the thing you're developing under the grant and the grant says hey you should you know potentially commercialize this and how do the scientific groups perform they say yeah yeah sure we will do that you know we will get the latvian patents and then we'll find some LTDs <laughs> just to sign, you know, the MOUs just to showcase that they're interested, whatever. But then when you go together with them as an entre entrepreneur, you often should, you know, uh, restructure the whole internal uh, kitchen at all because there is no commercialization pipeline. IP is whether, you know, structured among four different universities and they do not want to merge the IP for sure. <laughs> they would like, I don't know, to make some auctions and to sell this out. <laughs> and uh, that's, I think this is something that I, I, the investment agency here in Latvia, they try to, you know, revamp the whole thing uh, and to understand how they also uh, release grants and, and do the due diligence there. Because I think it's very important thing. And I've seen a lot of pro projects, good projects actually, but they failed because no VC would like to go, you know, to to give a capital with an IP among five universities fighting between each other. So that's mm. yeah. Tommy, you had a comment. Yeah, I thought the very very good comments from from both Matthias and Emil, and, and just wanted to kind of explain this, uh, like like share share like one investor view to this deep tech, and uh, we are we are the same like as as your customers in the sense that we don't care about the deep tech. Uh, in a way, except that it's for us, it has business value. Well, and then we think that for businesses, it has business value in the sense that uh, it's a protection. So, so let's say that if you are able to do something that at the heart of it, there is like a unique or, or kind of like a very specific capability. And then if you are able to package it well and deliver it to the market and sell it as a product, then when others want to kind of start competing with you, if they don't have the core that you had, they won't succeed. And, and, and that's really the, so for us, it's more like um, it's worthwhile working longer with those opportunities that, that have this defensibility. So, so this is the business interest that we have. It's a defensibility measure and uh, it, it's visible in two ways. It allows the companies to kind of continue to build their own business without competition catching up. And then it also makes the company fundamentally valuable that, that, you know, somebody might want to own the core and the core capability, even if you don't succeed as well in building the business as you desire. So you can be like moderately successful just because of the technology. But the big success always means that you need to succeed on the packaging of the product and the business. So I think very, very good insights. Just wanted to add this uh, like investor interest that it's 
it's different from this accelerator dimension, maybe what you Emil mentioned, that we are interested in for only for business purpose and uh, see it just as a positive, positive business dimension in a, in a, in a company. Mm -hmm. one, one comment that I have for this is that um, <clears throat> it also probably depends on investors, uh, let's say, competence in particular space, how early they are willing to take the risk. Uh, that if, if, for example, we uh, using our advisors and, and our own experience can understand some vertical really well, we are kind of willing to uh, take risk earlier because we understand uh, some of the upcoming challenges and how to solve them. Uh, at the same time, some other investor that might say that they are D-Tech as well, if they don't have advisors in this particular space or do not have experience in working with similar types of companies, they might say, hey, it's too early, please come back and show me the traction with, with uh, your customers and then I can get confidence. And so. I guess it depends also on that. And, and this means that <laughs> for, for uh, companies working on these uh, challenging technologies and products, uh, the investor base becomes narrower in a way. You have to find the right one that really understands what you do. That's true. Yeah. I, uh, I, I agree. Can... I, I got silent when you guys started talking about machine learning and AI. So, which is <laughs> which is far away from me. But then, only keywords were like s selling stuff, building a product out of technology, getting investment. I'm like, okay, so this is like all the and working with universities as well. So, <laughs> which is like already triggers. So, for for us, like the, the last the last thing we want to do is to work with the university because it's always so slow and bio bureaucratic. So you know what you know what you. Maybe it's only our experience, but we, we feel like, okay, we, if we work with them, we're never going to go anywhere. So, or at least any, anywhere fast uh, enough that we want. So mm -hmm. we spend another thing. So among the others uh, uh, that were mentioned with uh, Emil, so working with, uh, with, different, with different groups of uh, like stakeholders, customers, uh, my problem was uh, the problem of my team when we set up a company in Estonia in 2018, working with navigation and positioning. Like people were asking, "What these guys with Russian last names are doing here? Like with this, <laughs> <laughs> with the with the with this navigation technology and precise positioning?" So credibility was the other thing for us. So how to how to make uh, make our technology and the team look credible. So what, what, what are you going to do here? So uh, we are fine with that, but still, like, I have some nice memories <laughs> <laughs> from, from the period. Also, we had, to, we had to think how should we look at the European and international market. So we exactly we came with the technical solution, but it took us another two years until we came to the product. So to the product understanding and how, how should we build a business model around that and where should it, should it be disruptive? So, uh, and we bootstrapped, so pretty much. So we, we got a little investment from Startup Wise guys, which basically helped us to set the company and uh, make the first steps. We, we got the grant from ISA Big Estonia. So that there, are, there are some good opportunities here. Uh, that can keep you going. So then we were like, uh, um, we were sitting tight, uh, not losing, not losing too much energy. So and bootstrapped. So till we, till we found some answers to the question, what should be the business model? Because uh, otherwise, as you guys said, investors will ask you for traction, which is not, in, which is not in the place yet. So it's, it's mm -hmm. like so many no triggering, one. triggering phrases. <laughs> yeah. Um, think, Matthias, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe to add something here, maybe we're getting even further off track the discussion, but uh, um, um, like what, what I realized over the last year. So I was I was before working in sales and business development, and uh, I'm, I'm German, as you may have noticed from my name, but we're a Latvian startup. Um, so um, what I realized is that before, like let's say three four years ago. Um, when I came to Germany, I had to explain where Latvia is, uh, what Latvia is, uh, um, that it's not Lithuania, that it's not Estonia, that this is a separate country, that we don't speak Russian here. <laughs> so there was a lot of like uh, explanation. I realized over the last two years that it has completely changed. 
So this is, I think, comes also to credibility. Before it was like, yeah, there is this uh, this guy from some kind of Eastern European country. We don't know uh, um, what he wants from us. Now it actually changed. People understand that really good digital solutions come from here. That we're far ahead uh, in, in in the Baltic states of uh, of many uh, bigger companies uh, in Europe, and that that gives also already like some kind of base level of cre credibility. And that has changed actually, uh, I think, for us a lot. And I think this is. Uh, I'm very happy that there are so many startups around, and uh, um, that that there are so many uh, great uh, success stories. Because it helps also us. Because uh, now the discussion is not any more like how you can do that in Latvia. It's more like ah oh, yeah, Latvia of course. Uh, like like where else uh, could come uh, uh, some some IT solution from? And that just is I think a, a a good step and starts to give credibility. That doesn't of course mean anything yet. Uh, you still have to build also your own credibility. Sure. Uh, which will come back to the to the making pilot projects, testing, showing that your stuff works. Um, but I, I think this is a very, very positive uh, uh, development, at least I see it like this. Leon? Yes, I think one thing that most of us founders kind of like a cry we committed is we lost perspective on the way. Like for our customers, somehow they only care about their day-to-day -day operation. So we, we have to actually convert what is this deep tech, AI, whatever it is, actually translate it into what is this thing benefit you into your day-to-day -day operation and what can it benefit you in the in the, in the long run? And th that's the thing I, I feel the most. Like we are all the way deep in the rabbit hole. We assume everyone knows exactly what we're doing, knows the ins and outs, but that's not the case. <laughs> I, I realize that. That's, that's very, yeah. 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 I think Matthias exactly. understand that. Yeah. yeah. Matthias, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think this was also what I what I said in the in the beginning uh, when Leon was was not there yet. Um, convenience, convenience, convenience. This is the most important thing uh, um, for a software for for any solution on the market. I think convenience always wins, and uh, this is I think as a as a um, founder, especially as a startup founder, and and uh, as somebody who wants to build this into a into a successful company, it's very important to to keep that in mind. That for the customer, it's all about convenience, ease of use, low barriers of entry, um, easy to understand, don't need uh, six months to understand the software and to integrate it. This is, I think, the most important. And if I, th I think this is the first step to have a successful uh, uh, a product. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that one aspect that I also wanted to uh, discuss is uh, what what Tommy already touched upon briefly is this exitability of of uh, deep tech companies and uh, our own experience is that um, uh, if if companies have de developed technology which is rather unique and and uh, the team is highly competent in it uh, come quite early uh, exit interest from from uh, different larger players who want to integrate these technologies and products into their own offering because it, for them it's you know if not impossible then super difficult to develop something like that and and yet in order to stay competitive they need need to have it so we've seen for example in in um, uh, ambient sound investments portfolio we've altogether done something like 17 or 18 exits and in Parma portfolio already three exits and and many of these come based uh, can happen because the companies have something special that others want to own. And then you get to a good place that that you don't have to sell the company, but you have constant interest around the company. Have you guys like in in these early stages noticed that that the special something that you are building is a, is attracting, uh, let's say, already in early stages some some strategic interest, uh, and and how have you dealt with it? Maybe then I go first. Uh, so, so yes, uh, we have signed a ton of M&A NDAs uh, uh, already. Um, I, I think that is something good and this is also something bad um, because uh, it's, of course, good that people notice us and getting interested in what we're doing. Um, on the other hand, out of our experience, I mean, we don't want to sell yet. Um, these companies also will not buy yet. Uh, um, yeah. They just want to 
to check out and, and see what's going on and want to be the first to have dips on it. The second thing is it's very hard out of our experience to convert somebody who comes with the expectation of buying you into a customer. That's, I think, the second thing, because they want to test, they want to see how you're doing and then maybe buy you at some point. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, we have some good experience, but it's, it's mostly, it's, it's very difficult because their expectation of the engagement is, 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 uh, is different. It's not, they don't want to be a customer. Uh, they want to own you. And that's of course a, a different mindset. And so there is some good things to it. And there, there's also some, some bad things to it. I'll, I'll, I'll ask a quick question and then I'll come, uh, come back to you, Emil. Uh, when, when you mentioned the interesting thing that, that you have signed a number of uh, NDA, NDAs about it. So what's your own, uh, let's say, expectation or goal when, when doing that? Is it, is it more like you want to be known in the industry and that's why you kind of uh, want to show what you have to strategics? Or is it like genuine sales interest? Because another thing that you mentioned is that I wouldn't want to sell this uh, so it's kind of controversial. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, first of all, it's of course to, in, important to engage with the companies. I mean, it's 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 you know, it's business development. It doesn't have to be always uh, a sales effort. It's it's business development. There's also value for us, right? If if they do on their own money test our software within their operations and give us feedback, that that's huge value for us, even outside of M and A or sales or whatever. Um, so, so when we engage with a multinational company who has several billions of turnover a year and they say like, oh, that's an interesting product and we tested it and here are some, uh, so, some feedback from our users, from, from our employees, there is value in that as well. So that's why we engage with them. And if there comes a good offer, I mean, uh, you know, like, like I'm, I'm wrong enough in sales that I know like, like, you know, like you can have whatever opinion about something. Um, but you have to always listen what other people have to say. So, so if they come with a good offer, yeah, why not? Uh, if it's right, uh, if they come with no good offer, then you have to be also willing to say no. So it's just you listen what they have to say, and and then you make a decision. I think it's just like opportunities. Like <laughs> opportunities is the most important. That's the that's the uh, a currency of sales is opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think you're on mute. mute. We don't hear you. We don't hear you, Emil, now. Not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> I, uh, I can jump in while Emil yeah, is solving ahead, his Emil. problem. Uh, so we are <clears throat> we are not looking at the moment for M and A, uh, and we feel that this is like a comfortable spot to be at the at the stage where we are. So we can uh, like silently disrupt the market, and once we are bigger, so uh, people will come uh, and and look for that solution. So maybe it's uh, bold to say that way, but th this is how we look at it. Uh, the industry that we are working in is quite conservative as well so because the usual uh, the usual use case for this industry was a land surveyor who needs precise positioning before something should be built so that we have a cadastro plan and we we bring it to the uh, we bring it somewhere else uh, to to the government to, to municipality but now with these uh, robotic machines, uh, so it's a little bit different than these companies that provided services for the old school industries, we call them. They are still, I would say, uh, reluctant uh, with their business models to serve or to adapt for the new types of customers. So that's, uh, we see it as an opportunity because they, uh, a little bit, a little bit slower. So they they are missing it at the moment, and we are catch trying to catch on. Mm. Okay, Emil. Yes, I will try my best now. Perfect. It's perfect. So, perfect. Uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree with Matthias. This is what I said, and uh, I think you know it's. Um, uh, two two quick things about you know accessibility and actually working with big companies like big big farm or medtech is uh, two lessons learned for myself first and foremost you know 
around five years ago i you know i was wearing pink glasses and i thought you know hey these big guys know everything about everything so they know how to apply stuff they you know just you know clued it out it it's not true actually <laughs> so uh, you know we were working one of one of one of the um, uh computer components development companies uh, one of the major uh, the companies now you know working on joint product and interesting they haven't solved how to you know how to sell their part yet so uh, it's quite interesting so it's not like you know you come there and say hey this is my piece of the puzzle and they you know very maturely and quickly at, uh tap it into and everything works but another thing which is important what what we also are trying to do with all of the ndas you know and the feedback and design pilots and the clients is even if your technology is quite good and valuable uh, especially when we're speaking about the biotech they, they're quite conservative and the thing is that if you come and say hey you know i can make it better for i don't know 10 percent they would look into their value chain and and supply chain and they will say okay it costs us to you know to create such supply chain like five billion euros and it doesn't actually you know mean to us to tap it here because we will need i don't know to reshuffle the whole thing here and will cost it even more so that's why you know we're doing this tapping and understanding the pieces from various players and then trying to glue this all together into something very valuable for them and then mm -hmm you know, potentially, theoretically, when this is when the exit <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so if you want, what, what, you kind of do all this pre-work and, and partnerships and communications, and that might lead uh, to, to, to an interest when they understand that, hey, it's a good fit. Uh, I think at least, in, at least in theory, yeah. You know, if you show yeah, them yeah. that, hey, it's better, it's cheaper, it's faster, you know, I don't see any um, business, <laughs> other business challenges there. Yeah, yeah. Matthias, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I wanted to add that there was something that um so we also in the beginning um looked mainly for large companies. Um from a sales perspective, I think this was a mistake uh, um, because uh, the, the sales cycles are just too long. So we recently switched and, and have much better success with like mid-sized uh, 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 companies because the sales cycles are much shorter. Mm -hmm. But what I have to say, uh, what is a benefit? So, for example, we did uh, some things with Evonik Industries. In the chemical industry, everybody knows Evonik Industry. So it's also a matter of credibility, right? It's, it's, it's just like uh, you have something to show. If you start with mid-sized companies, it's, it's harder to explain what you did because everybody, when we say we, we did this and this with uh, Evonik Industries, everybody knows who is Evonik Industry, what, what they're doing, um, how approximately their processes look. And they will understand what we're doing. So it's a good example uh, to, uh, to, to pitch to customers what you're actually doing. However, uh, uh, for sales uh, uh, to, to, to gain customers, I think it's, it's, it's the, it's the, wrong, it's the wrong, wrong way to get, at least for, for us in our, in our situation. And I think this is often like this, that you, you, know, you, you lose your teeth by, uh, uh, while trying to, to get the, the big customers. Uh, while the actual customers and the actual money is, is somewhere completely else, it's maybe not so not so shiny. Doesn't make good uh, stories on your web page, but in the end, that doesn't you know like if you have one or two good good pilot projects and you you have something to talk about, I think that's enough, and then you should go for the money. Like where, where is actually the customer? And I think this is important. Can it be also that why why companies are going to, to these really large comp uh, companies is that um, that, uh, everybody believes that the name of the big company potentially helps them easier to, I don't know, get investors because everybody knows who's I know, Pfizer or BMW or something like that. And, and, uh, and also people, people believe that if I have this big name as a customer, it's a reference that kind of acts as a magnet for other customers. I guess that could be the <laughs> reason why people do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Quite you know, I think it's quite a stereotype. For sure, everyone knows who <laughs> Pfizer is, especially you know during the last one and a half years. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, yes. So I think it's you know, it's shiny, as Matthias said. It's shiny. You know, you like shiny cars. Everyone likes shiny cars. No one likes good working car. You know, which can bring you to I don't know to your farm and <laughs> bring some wood out of that. But you don't use uh, Ferrari to bring wood. But nevertheless, uh, without any philosophy there, I think uh, a, good, a, good, a good story for sure. You, it's also to show the reproducibility. And it's, you know, if you run for the big guy, uh, okay, but how are you going to find, 
hundred more big guys. If you don't <laughs> pilot, I don't know, with a big government or big, I don't know, big fabric, big university. It's, I think it's, you know, it's balancing between big names and big guys because it's, you know, when you're pitching out of the stage, it's cool to have them there. But, you know, because everyone will remember, mm, these guys are working with BMW. Cool. I have BMW, you know, or you know, my wife has BMW. <laughs> Let's, you know, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, but nevertheless, you will be looking also to MRR and, uh, you know, the projections. Yeah. And it's not about, you know, one big pilot is about, as Matthias said, maybe, you know, 10, you know, 10 companies paying on subscription basis or any other business model basis and then, you know, growing there. So, yeah. yeah. That's very well put. All right. I think we have only a few minutes left. Any any closing thoughts? Any comments that have not been said? I think that overall, kind of a, what what we covered here is that uh, that uh, first of all, uh, where we started from is that that deep tech has, is is kind of a word that everybody is using, but the definition is is not defined at all. So so everybody has a slight understanding um, but then then when we went into uh, the discussion uh, about companies that have developed some unique technologies and and uh, uh, building businesses on top of that where the, the the challenges are kind of the longer sales cycles the kind of a um, need for uh, investors with special understanding who would actually get involved in the early stage so that's that's definitely a challenge uh, but then again, on the on the positive side, we we ended up discussing that there's a defensibility uh, in the market, and and also there's uh, there's this uh, alternative exit path that that uh, you potentially attract interest from from um, uh, strategics who who want to own the technology, and they might buy out the company early, even if the commercials don't work, because they have ways to make it work themselves. Uh, so I think that these these are all kind of aspects that that we've recognized also during our work uh, over the past years with with the deep tech companies. All right, uh, thank you very much, guys, uh, for for your active contribution and discussion. It was uh, very interesting, and hopefully, hopefully, the crowd that was listening got some some thoughts or nuggets of uh, ideas that that uh, is beneficial to them. Yeah, thanks, 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 everyone. Good talking to you. Thanks, guys. Bye. It was a pleasure. Bye. 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 -bye.